Hey, I'm Danny Boyd. Um, today, the average shot length in a Hollywood film is just about three seconds long, uh, which looks something like this. Some believe that true love imbues a subject with the ability to... <laughs> That's down from an average of around five seconds 25 years ago, and from roughly 10 seconds back in the 1930s and 40s, which looks like this. No matter how clever he is, he still needs an exit visa. Or I should say two. Why two? He is traveling with a lady. I'll well, take one. I think not. I've seen the lady. If you're interested in reading more about what's contributed to this trend and other historic changes, I'll link to the source of this information below. But today, I'm not here to talk about what's average. I'm here to talk about one of the exceptions, one of my favorite exceptions, and of a $75 million superhero movie, no less. This is Unbreakable, the 2000 film from M. Night Shyamalan, coming in at an average shot length of almost 19 seconds. 23 if you discount a few spare quick cut scenes like this one. But most of Unbreakable is long, highly methodical, and impressively diverse. Cancer called me today. Uh, in Unbreakable, there are over 30 scenes that are all shot in one take. It's scary to do because the, because we never shot any safety coverage. He just knew that this is how this is how the shot was going to appear in the film. Much like Spielberg, Shyamalan's wonders in Unbreakable aren't really motivated by a particular aesthetic or style as much as they are by a goal to draw a clear and unseverable line between the audience and whatever it is in the scene that's most important at a given moment. In this case, not so concerned about remaining invisible, but simply about asking the question, what can we show with a single shot that would normally require two or three or four? I've never seen this. So before we delve into the really creative stuff, let's kick off with something simple. Two characters talking. Conventionally, you might have something like this, shot, reverse shot. Both characters of equal weight, cut on dialogue. I hope you can keep an open mind. But if you want action and reaction to remain in the same frame. Before Joseph was born, before we ever got married, or maybe you want your characters in singles because they're at odds with each other. Hope you find them. The lateral tracking shot is a way to maintain momentum while establishing clear cohesion within a space. That's not certain at all, is it? What's particularly interesting about this scene is that even though cuts are replaced by camera moves, unlike a cut, about all what? the camera doesn't move at the same rate as the conversation. Is the child correct? which means a character's response to a question. In college, I was in a car accident. Was it serious? He couldn't play football anymore. Might be provided more weight than the question itself. In Unbreakable, long shots are less concerned with what we're trained to think is important and more interested in what's actually important within the context of a scene. For instance, just because a scene involves two people doesn't necessarily mean it's about both of their experiences equally. This scene, like the other doorway scene we saw before, on its surface is about two characters having a conversation. I just want to ask you something, okay? When it's really about one character coming to the other with a question and the emotional response they have to the answer. Why cut away from her when it's her experience that matters? On the other hand, sometimes the main focus of a scene isn't on the one who's speaking at all. The kids still tell them of it, like it was some sort of ghost story. Here, it's the story of David's childhood accident and his response to learning about it that matters, not the person telling it. At no point during the shot, before or after, do we see the face of the nurse who's speaking. Sometimes, all you need is a close-up, the resolve in someone's eye, and a simple push from the camera to reinforce it. Shall I continue? As a quick aside, this shot resolves into one of the neatest spatial transitions ever. We move from Elijah's eye 
to an eye-shaped logo on some glass, refocused into a voyeuristic shot of David's wife Audrey, which we then learn from a point in a glance is in fact Elijah's POV. It's like a basic POV shot in reverse, like this, except it happens across two whole scenes. We actually get a similar transition to this earlier, only temporal, uh, the first time we meet adult Elijah. We move from little Elijah's POV of a comic book to his POV as an adult and reflection in the glass of an art frame. This is from Fritz Campion's own library. If you haven't seen Unbreakable, Elijah's moniker in the movie is Mr. Glass, and many of his scenes and introductions feature glass reflective surfaces in some way. It's one of the many running cinematic motifs in the movie. But even a simple camera move like this can serve a very different function depending on the length of a shot. For example, over the course of a few seconds, a push-in can raise tension or accentuate a moment. Uh, but over the course of three minutes? Yeah. As a color, not as rust. It can take a conversation from that of a superficial first date to a heavy exchange built around 20 years of marriage. You resent us, David? Resent the life you have? Alternatively, a slow pull can take us from a dynamic of inquisitiveness. Like what? Knowing when people have done something wrong. To one of rejection. Have a good life, Elijah. Or going back to the lateral tracking shot, watch as the camera abandons Elijah and David's relationship completely after David rejects Elijah's plea for the third time. Please stay away from my family. Now understand, of course, that there are plenty of conventionally and well-cut scenes throughout Unbreakable, which make great use of more varied and unique setups, but in general, the long shots in the movie are here to show us all the stuff that matters and none of the stuff that doesn't, as efficiently as possible and without the luxury of directing our attention through editing. Sometimes this is done by moving the frame, sometimes by moving characters inside the frame, sometimes by revealing something or someone that was previously obscured. What? $40. And sometimes it's done by bringing the subject of a conversation into view. He's Potter's cousin. Or into focus. He's starting cornerback at Tumpy University. He's going pro in the draft. The use of foreground and background relationships in Unbreakable is fantastic. No, sir, he is not. From a simple conversation. I read about you in the paper. To a scene like this one, where an out of focus element downstage. Are you certain you were in the passenger car? is used to build tension around what's occurring in focus upstage. Yes. Unbreakable's wonders are great because they aren't gimmicky. They're too efficient and too selective for that. While many of the film's long shots do encompass entire scenes, many others are sandwiched by shorter shots that motivate their particular style. The young girl's POV on the train, or the famous gun scene. Don't do it. Shot handheld to bring in tension. Just shoot him once. Joseph, listen to what your mother. <laughs> but preceded and followed by steady mounted shots that provide calm and then relief before and after. Basically, the number one benefit of, of pacing it like that is that you feel part of that world more so. It helps me achieve a symbiotic relationship between the main character and the audience, which is the goal. I talked a couple of weeks ago about the 1974 adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express compared to the 2017 version and how the differences in average shot length across similar scenes, shot 40 years apart, was palpable. I'll link to it at the end here. But Unbreakable shows that these kinds of decisions made around staging, framing, coverage, aren't totally locked to genre or when a film was made, but by vision and being deliberate about what your story is and how you want it told. If you haven't seen Unbreakable, all I can say is don't let Shyamalan's couple of less than stellar hits deter you. This is one of his best films, one of Tarantino's top films of all time, and a personal favorite of mine. Plus, of course, you know. They say this one has a surprise ending.
I'm Danny Boyd. Thanks for watching.